On today's episode of Sports Medicine Weekly, we visit with an ultra-marathon runner, a spectacular endurance athlete and coach who tells us how he trains, how he eats to win, and advice for you. And also, if you're suffering from arthritis, what can you do to get back on the track? We've got Dr. Brian Cole. I'm Steve Cashel. And our guest today is Zach Bitter, an ultra marathon runner. But first, to be your best, you start with best practices. Eat better, grow stronger, reach higher. At Midwest Orthopedics at Rush, their work is what best practices are built upon. They're a team of leading physicians with the highest level of experience and training, prolific researchers delivering pioneering breakthroughs, orthopedic experts that other orthopedic specialists and their patients come to when they need individualized care. Get it done right the first time at Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. Visit RushOrtho.com slash the best. Vericell develops, manufactures, and markets cytologous cell-based therapies for patients with serious diseases and conditions. For more information about their products, visit Vcell. That's V C E L dot com. <laughs> Dr. Cole, we've got a great guest. We've been looking forward for weeks to having Zach uh, Bitter on right here. Zach, an endurance athlete and coach. He has broken multiple world and American records throughout his career, helped hundreds of runners reach their personal goals. He helps the beginner to advance runners regardless of their starting point and lifestyle. He's 35 years old and uh, we thought we'd bring Zach on because uh, not only is he doing great things for himself with the record holding, but uh, what struck me, Dr. Cole, was you know helping hundreds of runners um, with their goals. That, that's a neat thing. Yeah, absolutely. This is it, it, you, you would never imagine that running is a team sport, you know, Steve. And uh, having uh, recently had the marathon in Chicago, uh, you it's it's more, have you have you ever watched the marathon? Have you been downtown in, in Chicago? No, when it's not, gone not on? in person. I have not. It's, it's pretty inspiring. Like, you might even get the bug and say, this is something I really want to do, you know? Um, it's pretty crazy just because it, it first it brings an entire city together, but it really becomes a team sport that way. But I've always been amazed, not only at marathoners, but those who sort of go the extra mile, these ultra athletes that we see. So uh, I'm super happy to have this episode with Zach. I have lots of questions. And, you know, and, and the things that he does do relate to uh, – just what the average everyday individual does in terms of, you know, should they have discomfort, should they have problems in doing these activities, you know, how do they get through it? And the fact that some of these individuals can go through, you know, 75 marathons, for example, and never have a problem with their joints is pretty phenomenal. So uh, it's going to be a great episode. Yeah, and even one thing I'll throw on that, I just learned a couple of days ago, like you mentioned the Chicago Marathon, and whoever won it like ran in the Boston Marathon the next day. Right. I was just, yeah. I was, are you kidding me? You think they need a week to uh, six months off, and all of a sudden they're running again, so we're going to ask Zach about that. So Zach, thanks so much for joining us here on Sports Medicine Weekly and our podcast. So take us uh, through your background first, a childhood. Where did you grow up, and uh, how did you develop a passion for running yeah, well, thanks so much for having me on, guys. Uh, yeah, I kind of got into running at a pretty early age. Uh, I want to say it was in sixth grade. My PE class did a presidential physical fitness challenge where I was kind of introduced to a variety of different like fitness benchmarks, I guess you'd call them. And one of those happened to be the mile run. So uh, my, my very tiny class of, I think, eight students at the time, uh, I was able to, to finish first. And that was kind of a little sign to me, I guess, that like, when it came to, you know, sprinting, I'd maybe middle of the pack. When it came to stretching, I was probably in the back of the pack. But when it came to the mile run, I was able to do quite a bit better than in some of those other activities. And uh, I just enjoyed it, too. And my other classmates seemed to really never want to do it again. And that was maybe another little clue in the back of my head that it was something I should should take serious, take a little more seriously or check out at least. So I was really fortunate, though. My parents didn't, like, force me into it or really like direct my trajectory through sports. So I was able to participate in a wide range of things like soccer, football, baseball, basketball, uh, you know, basically all the kind of classic sports along the way. And by the end of my high school track and cross country seasons, um, I started to kind of really start to make that more of a focus point in terms of what I wanted to focus on. And in college, then it became kind of like the only thing I was really doing from an athletic standpoint. 
What college? How do, how do you? How, where, you, you, you know, he, I saw in his bio, Steve. He went to Stevens Point, and uh, full mm-hmm. conf- is that right? Is that right, yep. Zach? You, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It's, it, true, true, full on confession. The uh, Stevens Point. The only thing I knew about Stevens Point was in high school that they had beer that you could buy if you're eighteen. This is when I. This is as my age. You wouldn't know this, but you could actually go to Stevens Point and get beer if you're eighteen or younger and get Stevens Point beer. Right? It was about four dollars a case, something like that. Yeah, my guess is doing what you were doing. You weren't imbibing at that time. Fair to say? Not too much. Uh, there were a few <laughs> kind of key points during the season where we would indulge as teams, but we tried to stay away from the the whole Thursday, Friday, Saturday night routine. <laughs> there you go. Let me let me ask you a question. Um, how do you transition from just being a runner, doing cross country, distance running to ultra marathoning? And and tell our tell our listeners what an ultra marathon is because it's not the same thing. Uh, uh, when you're doing some of these races that are, you know, hundred miles plus, it's a whole different category. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess technically they would consider anything a 50 kilometer and beyond is usually kind of like the entry point to ultra marathon. And then depending on where you're at, it'll range a little bit. You get real, it gets real popular sometimes on like real steep, rugged terrain type areas where, you know, you could have a distance that's you know, shorter than a marathon that could take you two, three times as long as it would to run a kind of a classic, like Chicago marathon pilot style course. So you get like a little bit of a kind of gray area there, but a lot of folks in North America are usually kind of the least targeting getting to like a hundred mile. That seems to be a distance that people really like to kind of work up to and build to. So for me personally, I can't take credit for doing this necessarily intentionally, but my progression through distance running was pretty gradual in the amount of kind of Dress, I think I placed on my body with it. So like early on in high school, I was training what would be considered a pretty low volume approach from most of my collegiate teammates. And then in college, we had a little bit of a higher volume training program. So I was more introduced to that, but I spent basically the entirety of that working up to, you know, even remotely close to the distances I will do in training for, for ultra marathons. And then, you know, I spent a couple more years after college kind of building that as well. So it was uh, what I like to call micro stressing. So you start with where you're at and you introduce a little bit of a stress component that is going to be the reality of exercise, but you give yourself the right amount of recovery to bounce back, adapt to it. And then once you got to get comfortable with that, you can kind of add more. And then if you do that long enough, by the time you're 35, you find yourself running hundred mile races <laughs> like me, I guess. <laughs> hundred mile races. That's unbelievable. I mean, the, the marathon is to me unbelievable in itself. And I credit everyone that's ever tried it, uh, trained for it, accomplished it. And, uh, these people doing it in two hours, it's m- almost unbelievable. But Dr. Cole, 100 miles. Yeah. So I was just looking <laughs> at a time, uh, Zach. So you, you, your hundred, your hundred mile time in August of 2019 was 11 hours and 19 minutes was, was, forgive me. Was that a world record was like, I know you bested someone who had from like 2002, but where does that fall? 11 hours, 19 minutes, a running that long, but B doing a hundred miles in that amount of time is just insane. When you think, when you compare that down to the three, three and a half hour for just a marathon, right? So was that a world record or where did that fall in all records for ultra marathons? Yeah. So when I ran that race, that was in uh, August of 2019 and it was uh, a world record at the time I broke the previous world record, which was 11 hours and 28 minutes and three seconds, uh, by a little less than 10 minutes, uh, with 11, 19, 13 was mine, which comes out to about a six forty seven and a half and a half minute per mile pace. Or for those marathon enthusiasts out there, there's like a 12 hour component to you too, where you try to see how far you can get in 12 hours. So I continued after I hit hundred miles for another 41 ish minutes and then got to 104.8 eight miles, which was also a world record at the time for, for that particular timed event. And that comes out to about four, three hour marathons consecutively. Just, just absolutely blows me away. Yeah. So, yeah. So how do you look, train for something like that, Zach? Yeah. You know, I like to look at it kind of the same way someone would look at training for any endurance, uh, endurance plan following like a periodized training schedule. So there's different types of like workouts that are kind of really kind of key workouts that are going to move the needle and getting you better at it. And if I want to kind of sum those up real quickly, they're kind of like you have short intervals, you have long intervals and tempo runs, uh, you have like your long run development and then you kind of have like your, your foundational or base 
base pace or aerobic threshold is what they'll call it sometimes where you're trying to kind of the bulk of your training is going to be up to that. And really it just comes down to an order of operations as to like when you're going to do those specific things. So the guide for me is always what is the intensity and the environment I'm going to race at. And then I'm going to kind of do the least specific things that are still important first and then work myself closer to what's most specific to what I'll be doing on race day. So if I were to say decide to train for a five kilometer, I'd probably still do a lot of the same workouts that I do for training for a hundred miler. I just might be doing those short intervals closer to the race that I'm targeting itself because they're going to be much more close in intensity. Whereas when I'm doing uh, an ultra marathon or a hundred miler, when I get like, say four, six weeks out from the race itself, I'm going to be doing a lot of longer runs that are much closer to the pace that I'm going to be targeting on the, the day of the race itself. So it almost kind of like works in reverse from what you would see from a more of a traditional endurance plan. Are, are you always training or do you have some off season? Yeah, usually what I'll do is I'll pick a race that I'm really going to try to kind of peak for. And in a in a non-COVID year, usually that'll mean like I'll do a few kind of tune-up races or uh, like practice races, so to speak, where I'm not necessarily going to back off training going into them. I'm going to use them as like highly structured long runs. And that's, then, that's not a 5K, right? That's a marathon, probably a practice race for you. Yeah, I'll use anything from like half marathon, marathon, 50K, sometimes up to 100K, but usually that's about as far as I'll usually push it if I'm trying to still peak for a 100 miler. Uh, and I'll pick maybe two at most three of those key races per year that I'm really going to try to like show up and have my best day for. And after any one of those, I'll usually take a couple of weeks where I'm not going to do any structure training for the most part. I'm going to kind of let my body and mind hit the reset button. And then I'm going to really kind of just assess what I really want to prepare for next and, and then uh, start kind of putting the structure in place there, but kind of build back up a little, little more gradually than where I would have been at when I had just finished kind of preparing for that race. How important is diet, Zach? What do you eat? And, um, is it, is it a constant, you know, 24 seven, I'm on a certain diet, um, or is it getting ready for race day different? Yeah, there's going to be some variance, just like kind of the training has its periodized components where I'm doing certain things or I'm focusing on, uh, getting or addressing certain intensities and things like that. And training my diet does have a little bit of uh, variance with that as well. Uh, for me personally, I find that I do best when I'm in a lower carbohydrate diet. For me, the question is just how low am I going to go with that? So when I'm like an off season or not running structured at all, I'll be quite low, kind of close to what a lot of folks would maybe consider a stricter ketogenic style diet. Once I kind of get into structured training, I'll, I'll bring back some of the carbohydrate. Uh, but compared to what you see in most kind of standard endurance nutrition protocols that are going to be like moderate to high carbohydrate intake, I'm just going to be quite a bit lower than that, even on my highest carb kind of portions of the training, which can push up to maybe 20%, sometimes on a rare occasion, 30% of my intake coming from carbohydrates. But uh, those will be like the higher volume and higher intensity phases of training where I'm kind of flexing up those ones. We want to ask Zach about, um, has he ever had any injuries and also uh, what it takes to reach the top and break records? And also for our listeners, the best way to get started if they've never run before and can they uh, train effectively on things like a treadmill. But first, uh, thanks to a couple of our sponsors, you know, fall weather is here. Time to get outside, enjoy your favorite activities, and spend precious time with family and friends. Aches, pains, or an injury should not be part of the memories you're making. The therapists at Rush Physical Therapy are here for you. With more than 60 locations throughout greater Chicagoland, Rush's clinical experts will get you back to life. Go to RushPT.com today to schedule an appointment. Not sure if physical therapy is right for you? Request a complimentary consultation and discover the power of Rush Physical Therapy today. Episode also brought to you in part by Karen Malkin and her new protein brownie bar and superfood bars. Best tasting bars on the market. Certified gluten-free, paleo, no added sugar, Karen's Protein Brownie Bars and Superfood Bars available on Amazon and at KarenMalkin.com. That's K-A-R-E-N-M-A-L-K-I-N.com. Zach, you know, you mentioned um, the low-carb situation, and we often think about carbs as our fuel. 
And, you know, you're, the common thing you see is someone out eating a pasta dinner before a marathon. So it's a little counterintuitive. And these, this mileage is, is pretty severe and almost catabolic, breaking your body down. And you need energy. How, how do, is that a common diet routine to uh, carb sparing or at least low carb? Because that, I, I have to admit, I'm completely unfamiliar with. Is it something unique to you specifically or is it something that ultra marathoners do in general? Yes, yeah, really good question. I would say it's definitely growing. It's grown quite a bit since I started a little over 10 years ago uh, to the point now where there's there's enough folks that are following it where it gets a lot of attention, it uh, gets a lot of interest. A lot more people have either tried it or are curious about it at this point, but it does tend to be a little more specific for the longer endurance runs like ultra marathons. Just because when you think of like your race day intensity, we're talking about paces or intensities that are going to be quite low, even relative to kind of like easy running paces out there. So you just have a little bit more of a flexibility to, to lean on a slower burning fuel source. Um, as you know, like our glycogen stores are quite small compared to our fat stores. Even, you know, you take that, the leanest athlete at the Olympics in the marathon, that person has way more fat on their body than they do glycogen reserves from an energy standpoint. So when you slow the pace enough, like what you're going to see with most people running a hundred miles, you open up this window to have like a little more of either a dual or um, or a, a higher focus on fat as a as a fuel source. So a lot of times, what happens from with people I've worked with and as well as people I've talked to about this and and people in ultra marathons, you get this issue of like stomach distress or gastrointestinal issues that are very easy to have happen on a run that takes you sometimes over a day to finish. And when you have those types of situations, they, they, they slow you to a halt and sometimes cause you to drop out. So, um, folks who've struggled with that or don't want to have to be as reliant on exogenous fuel sources during a race themselves will, will focus a little more on raising their fat oxidation rates so that the little bit of carbohydrates they'll need relative to their moderate to high carb counterparts on race day will just be less likely to cause some sort of stomach issue or digestive issue because they're not going to be kind of bombarding their digestive system with quite as much exogenous fuel during their, their event itself. Without giving any uh, tips away, if that's a thing in your world, <laughs> like what would be a typical pr- immediate pre-race prep? And then what do you do during the race? You go 11, 15, whatever, how many hours you're running. I assume you have to take, you have to have some fuel during the way. So what does it look like before you go you know, give us an idea what that is. And then what do you do during the race? Yeah. So morning of, I'm usually going to stay away from carbohydrates. I'll have the fats and proteins and I'm usually trying to go pretty low volume, which is a lot easier to do with fats and proteins. They're just more calorie dense. Uh, and you know, so that could be anything from something like, uh, you know, a protein bar that's fats and proteins, uh, to like to creamer and coffee eggs or something like that. Um, And then uh, during the race itself, I'll start out probably the first 45 minutes or so just drinking water. Then at about 45 minutes, I'll start to introduce small amounts of carbohydrate throughout the course of the day. So kind of like- What is that, Zach? I'll I'll use a product called S-Fuels Race Plus, which uh, a packet of that has about 16 grams of carbohydrate in it. So I'll usually have one to two packets of that every hour. Is it a Uh, liquid? It's a powder that you mix in with liquid. So I'll have like my water bottle and I'll- I'll pour it in that and you know shake it up and and just drink that on the go. So um, I'll do that and I'll kind of combine that with maybe a more of a solid food option too, so that I'm not just taking in all liquid calories. So that could be anything from like uh, just like a salty cracker or something like that or pretzel type consistency type of thing. I like to try to mix up the flavor profile a little bit since the S Feels Race Plus tends to be a little sweeter tasting. So, uh, you kind of counteract that with something a little more crunchy, savory, salty type of stuff is, is the direction I usually like to go. And, um, and I'll just basically do that most of the day. There'll be like in, depending on the race I'm doing, if it's like a track event, like what I did for when I ran 11 hours and 19 minutes for hundred miles. I and mean, that was on a 438 meter track. So I could basically grab anything I wanted from my crew whenever I wanted it. And then you can kind of start making requests Whereas a lot of these races are done out on trails where you're going to go through aid stations and you may not have a crew there. So you have to kind of just figure out what you want based on what they have at the aid station and, and kind of roll with what the options are there. But usually they have a pretty big spread of a variety of different things at those. And you can always kind of usually have drop eggs taken to a lot of the aid stations as well if you have something really particular that you want. 
All right, after 100 miles, okay, um, you want to eat uh, a pizza, you want a beer, <laughs> you want to go to sleep. Uh, what, do you, what do you want? You want a Gatorade? You want to just eat nothing? What, what is it? I usually want the biggest, fattiest, saltiest steak I can get my hands on. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's weird because I, when I finish a race like that, it's a little touch and go and kind of what you even want. Like you, you do tend to like lose your appetite for a little bit afterwards. And you also kind of lose your ability to fall asleep. Everything is just kind of whacked out after running a hundred miles. So um, as much as you would, like to sleep sometimes that next night can be a little bit restless uh usually it takes a couple hours of just kind of hydrating and getting some electrolytes in before i start to get my appetite but then i'm usually craving something savory after after a race for whatever reason what about injury zach all right uh this is a sports uh medicine show so i'm real interested to hear uh any arthritis where's the pain is there any pain what have you suffered before any surgeries in in the past yeah, it's a good question. I mean, runners oftentimes do have injuries. It's kind of a, a commentary in the community. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. So you know, most runners who do it long enough come up with something, even if the, the, the ones who tend to be very uh, non-prone to injury, which I put myself in. I've actually only had two injuries since starting ultra running in 2010 that have had me cancel a goal event. So one was a stress fracture on my right sacra ala. Uh, which took about seven weeks to kind of heal. It's basically your tailbone. And uh, I had like a small stress fracture on that. And I, I, the, the doctor said they assumed I got it from running downhill on pavement when I was probably just overloading a little bit on that style of training, uh, which, which made sense to me because I had been doing a lot of kind of flat training up to then. And then I had gotten into a race that had a lot of climbing and descending in it. So I kind of switched the gears a little bit and started kind of doing a little too much, probably with the change in environment to expect my body to adapt to it properly and wound up hurting that. So that just basically took, you know, stress fractures are kind of different than a lot of other running related injuries in that you kind of have to just take all impact, all exercise, all movement away from it and let it heal. Whereas other things like tendonitis or, you know, any type of arthritic type of thing or any like partial tears and things like that, a little bit of movement can be helpful. And then also strengthening that area around it can be helpful too. So another issue I had is uh, I injured my right ankle. Actually, this one was more recently. So once I kind of gave that a few weeks just to settle down, the, the way to approach it is to kind of start to load that area up very gradually. And over time, like if I kind of just keep progressing it slowly, build strength in that area and get it kind of back up to full training capacity. And once I can do that on kind of more controlled terrain, then it's like time to kind of expose it to very terrain, some more trail type stuff to strengthen it up even more. And it's kind of like with those type of injuries, uh, the advice I've always gotten is once you can kind of get back to training, if you can keep kind of the pain threshold to like a three of 10 or lower is kind of a good gauge to get some movement there, but not overdo it to the point where you're kind of taking a step backwards. Is there, is there some aspect of a race, uh, that is always physically uncomfortable? Like you just know it's going to be that way. I don't know if it's any, whether it's chafing or sweating or you know, like, even if it's like something you don't, you know, that the, our listeners to this episode may not ever you know experience. What's the worst part of it physically? And does it happen every race or is it just sometimes? Yeah, there's a level of like just quadricep soreness that kind of comes in almost no matter what. It's probably a little more pronounced if you do a course, a lot of downhill running, you just get a little more eccentric contraction doing that. Uh, But you do find that uh, probably somewhere around like halfway or two thirds of the way through a hundred miler, like your, your quads are pretty sore and they probably won't get a whole lot worse, but then it just becomes like a battle with yourself where since that area is, is hurting a little more than it was in the beginning, you're just kind of constantly dealing with the, the, the mental stress of pushing through that. And that just gets a little more pronounced, a little more taxing and you have to be a little more focused at that point to kind of maintain your pace versus just how kind of quickly and effortlessly the miles feel kind of early on. Do you run the entire time or do you ever, is there ever a walk part of it or is that just what you're, you know, fueling and drinking or maybe even not then? 
Yeah, I would say like in, in the controlled events, like these short loop courses, and I've done some that are like just over a mile down to 400 meters. I had one at the USA uh, 100 mile road championships this past April where I was able to win that race. I didn't stop once. So uh, that one was continuous movement other than like some, there was some like kind of walking aid when I was, it was 94 degrees that day in Las Vegas. So it was like, we were just dumping water on ourselves all day long. So there was some slower movements going through the aid station transition point to kind of topically cool and grab fuel and things like that. Um, I've had other races where I've stopped twice for about 90 seconds when I ran my fastest 100 mile time. I think I stopped three times for maybe three to four minutes total, uh, but it's mostly moving. Um, that's kind of the beauty of those short loop courses is you really don't have an excuse to stop unless you have to like maybe use the bathroom or you just have like a, a moment of weakness, so to speak, because everything can kind of be kind of spoon fed to you on a course like that. You get to these trail races, though, where you're self-serving at aid stations and things like that. You kind of have some forced stoppage just so you can make sure you're staying on top of things like fuel hydration and any type of blisters or anything that might come up along the way. I got a question for Dr. Cole now. As an orthopedic surgeon, you've been dealing with runners, Dr. Cole, a long time. You've operated on runners. For a, a, a person, an individual who might run a 100-mile um, you know, ultra marathon. What are you thinking about? What, what happens to the knees? What, what could take me through the biologics? Um, you know, and, and have you ever seen anyone like that? And, uh, how does the body break down or, or, you know, can it break down or does it not break down? This is a little bit of uh, self-selection, Steve. You know, we talk about genetic evolution. Um, people who are running uh, 100 mile races into their 30s and 40s and sometimes longer, and I'd be interested to hear what the average age range is and how far they go. These are genetically uh, uh, privileged people. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but you know, uh, Zach wouldn't be where he is if his joints and his body wasn't built the way it is. You can't even train for that. So there's some, some fascinating work that's looked at uh, those who have run, you know. Huge numbers of marathons, ultra marathoners. It was a great study that looked at a very large number of people who did an average of 75 marathons, the the average across their life, and they had no increased incidence of hip or knee arthritis. Okay, so you say, well, yeah, obviously, then running must not be so bad. That's not really the conclusion, even though they sort of made that conclusion. I'm not sure that is the conclusion. I think the conclusion is that there's a genetically predisposed group of people who can run and not suffer problems. And I think that's a unique, you, know, you and I you know, are probably not built that way. But, you know, so injury is one thing. You have an acute event, things like that. But I think that those who can do it for an extended period of time are those whose joints, you know, most of our joints are built to say last, you know, 75, 80 years, right? But that's just not how it happens all the time. And, and you can't blame yourself. You can blame your parents. But if you're, I, I would bet, Zach, that you have, I'm, I'm just guessing, if you go back to your lineage and your parents and your your siblings and so forth, if you have them, they've probably had very few problems with their joints or otherwise. Um, as opposed to, Steve, you and I know people who get arthritis. You ask them, well, well, how, did your parents have knee replacement, things like that. So this is a genetic conservation thing. This is not, so it's sort of survival of the fittest, not to be Darwinian about it, <laughs> but I think it's a lot of that. Um, yeah, can injuries happen? And do I see patients in the office who are, you know, their entire sort of, existence depends upon their ability to run. I do. I mean, I have some of my Mondays are, especially around the time of the marathon, are pretty crazy visits because there are these people, there's are, there are a number of people who are very emotionally connected to their ability to run. And if that's taken away from them, it's particularly devastating. You know, it's what, it's what's their, it's what's holding them up, you know? So, um, that population, especially those who have arthritis, who I'm trying to get back running again, I, I often tell them, I say, look, there's not a lot of data that shows that you running will make your the known existence of your arthritis in your knee or hip worse. That much I can tell you, okay? What we do know is that, for example, a history of obesity or a history of previous knee surgery or traumatic injury, that's a population that actually might suffer living a life like Zach does, okay? But if you are told that, hey, here's an MRI that shows a little bit of arthritis, and the next logical question is, well, should I give up running? It's fascinating, but there is not sufficient data that tells us that running will cause that to progress, which I find really helpful to talk to patients. But the bigger challenge is if they get arthritis, to keep them out there, um, yeah, we have lots of tricks. There's many things I can do, but it is, you know, most symptoms of cartilage breakdown or arthritis are load related. And what Zach does is about the highest load condition one could ever, I, that I can imagine, you know, so 
you either shrink your world to adapt to your joint if you're having a problem, or we, we as orthopedic surgeons try to figure out a way to expand your joint to adapt to the world you want to live in. And guys like Zach don't want to be told to give anything up um, <laughs> ever. So, hey, Zach, what, what is the uh, average age? And what, like, what's the range of ages that you see doing your sport? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure what the average age is. I know it's come down a little bit since I started. It, as the sports got more popular, those younger folks have kind of gotten into it a little earlier. Whereas I think when I started, it was kind of this kind of more or less uh, approach of, you know, you'd kind of do the standard distances. And then when you've uh, peaked out on those, then you kind of get into ultra marathons. So you'd see a lot more folks kind of in their later 30s, early 40s, kind of getting into the sport versus now you're having you know, D1, D2, D3 collegiate athletes getting into it right after, right after that. And sometimes even younger. So I've seen folks as young as 12 do an ultra marathon. And I want to say the oldest I've saw is like 80. Um, I know there's been a handful of 70 plus year olds that have finished one of the most well-recognized hundred miler and in the country and world for that matter, the Western States 100. So there's a pretty big age range out there. <laughs> I, I, let me, let me, you know, the training, you know, when I run, I was training, I do some climbing and I use running for some of my training just from an endurance point of view. And is it, is, is it lonely? I know that's, you know, maybe you find that a strange question, but you're out there, you're not talking to anyone, right? Mm-hmm. It reminds me of like open ocean sailing. There's these amazing sail races where you go, literally you can sail around the world, right? These races that, that start in France and you sail around the world, you don't see another human being. You could be a week, two weeks without seeing another person. It could drive a normal, you know, to someone who can tolerate that stuff cr- crazy. Is it lonely, the training, these miles? I mean, what do you think about? What do you do to get yourself through it? And when you're doing a race, what's that like? I imagine you could be without social contact for a prolonged period of time for some of these trail races. Yeah, for sure. I think like, I think one of the draws to this sport actually kind of feeds into that a little bit where like, there's just no way to run a hundred miles without doing a little self-discovery. So like part of the objective out there is like, I'm going to kind of strip myself raw and get myself to a point where like, I want nothing more than to quit and then push through that. So that's, a you know, the, the loneliness kind of comes with this where you're just, you, you, there's no distractions, you know, there's not another person to kind of pull you away from thinking about like your low points or your high points and everything like that. So I think there's a lot of inward looking with that. And then there is the, the occasional situation where someone's in hitting a rough spot and then another person runs up and they run with them and it pulls them out of it. And then they become like best friends, even though they had never <laughs> known each other before. That. Right. Right. Uh, the training is the other side of that equation, which is, you know, the bulk of the, the running that you do. People look at the event and things like that, but really the amount of miles and time spent to prepare for it is really where a lot of that is invested. And uh, for that, it's like, you just kind of, you can get creative and it's usually like person dependent. Some people who are maybe a little more extroverted are going to find themselves running in groups a lot more frequently or having training partners. Whereas, you get more introverted folks who maybe look at that as an opportunity to get away from people. Maybe they work a job that they're interacting with a lot of coworkers and their kind of reset for them is to go out and run for a couple, couple hours and have nothing but uh, um, their own thoughts to kind of worry about. So I think there's a pretty big range with that as well. Yeah, I will tell you, that's a, you? sorry, Steve, just one other final comment. That's a, that's a, one of the troubles, most troublesome things that my patients tell me is running for them is, is profoundly therapeutic. And when it's taken away from them, they lose, that's their balance bucket, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they work, they have jobs, they have families, they have kids, they do all their things. But when they lose running, it's just, it's like their oxygen for their lives. And that's when the visits in my practice become particularly emotional. So Steve, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to sort of add that. No, it's interesting. And uh, Zach, I wanted to ask you, because I've been, have this written down for a long time now, weightlifting. How important is it for an endurance athlete? Do you lift weights? You do any training with weights? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's been something that has evolved quite a bit since I started running. I remember when I kind of first got into it, it was like if you were a runner and you weightlifted, it was because you really wanted to weightlift. <laughs> you know, that was kind of more uh, looked at as if you if you're spending time in the gym, you may as well be out running more miles and fine tuning your craft, and then. I think as people got more interested in just the research behind running and running performance and injury prevention and things like that, and you know a lot of more money gets pumped into the sport around Olympic time and things like that, we just got better studies that looked at different weightlifting procedures and things that were going to be beneficial for endurance athletes too. So uh, what I think surprises people a lot of times is they think, well, you know, runners, they're you know these tiny little people most of the time, and they're going to be in the gym doing like know, 200 reps of some really, really light weight or body weight stuff, where in reality, 
I think um, the stuff that really moves the needle from an injury prevention stamp, or not maybe not injury prevention as much as just like imbalances. So as runners, we have a lot of issues sometimes with things like tight hips, posterior chain weakness, quad dominance type things, like glute activation type things where you can get a lot of benefit from some of the core movements like squats, deadlifts, weighted lunges, kettlebell swings, box steps, uh, things like that, hip thrusts, weighted hip thrusts and things like that. So um, some, you know, you, you, if you look at like a professional Olympic distance runner, you might see them putting some weights on the bar from time to time. <laughs> That's Zach, let me ask you a personal question. Are you, do you have a day job or are you spend all your, your whole life is running? Yeah. So I started out as a full-time teacher when I first got into ultra marathons. And then as my career kind of progressed and I started kind of building a coaching business around, around my training and racing, I got to a point where it was like something kind of had to give if I wanted to be, uh, really efficient at any one of my, uh, my activities. So I started looking at kind of being a little more of a full-time runner. And as I got into that, I just kind of started adding different things to it. So I'll do my training and racing. I'll do my coaching stuff, but also do podcasts and things like that as well. So I found pretty early after when I quit teaching that I didn't necessarily just want to be training and racing. Uh, That seemed like, I mean, there's only so much running you can do. I know it sounds like a lot from time to time, (laughs) but if you look at the amount of running I do compared to what some people will work on a day job, it's quite a bit less. So it's more of a kind of a part-time job, I guess, from the actual act of time spent running and training. And then it's like, what are you going to do with the rest of your time? And for me, I'm just not great at sitting around and waiting for the next run. So I get interested in other things like helping other people learn how to run and like recording podcasts on topics that I'm interested in or talking to people who I want to learn something from. Before we let you go, so you do coach other runners or people who want to get into running. Is, is that a business for you then? And how do you coach them? What's the youngest, oldest runners you've worked with? Yeah, so I do coaching. It's mostly virtual at this point from my website at zachbitter.com. You know, I've worked uh, with s- students as young as middle school age when I was still teaching. I'd coach cross country and then I also coach high school for cross country and track. Uh, so age range has been anywhere from 10 up to, I think my oldest client to date is 68. So, uh, um, pretty wide open in terms of that, as well as distances. I still kind of have a passion for the sub ultra distances and I really like just the, the process of preparing. So if someone's interested in, you know, performing or peaking for their 5k or learning kind of the ins and outs of that, or if they want to run, you know, a multi-day race, I'm happy to help them. All right, final question for me. Um, is everything outside or can you train effectively inside on a treadmill? And how often do you use a, a treadmill or something similar? Yeah, yeah. You, I do most of my training outside, but I will throw in some treadmill stuff from time to time. When I first got into running, it was during the winter months in Wisconsin because you get these 20 degree, 20 degree below zero type days. And, you know, it's just like if I want to do a workout or anything other than just surviving the temperatures, it was the quality was going to be on the treadmill. Now that I live in Phoenix, it's a little reverse where it's like, you know, maybe end of July, it's 115 degrees outside. If I want to do a workout, it's probably a little easier to do that on a treadmill. So I'll do some of that. And actually during the pandemic, I found myself in a position where there was no races to do. And I did a a hundred mile treadmill run uh, in my house, live streamed it back in May of 2020. So uh, I have done some ultra marathons on a treadmill. (laughs) Neat. Good stuff. Dr. Cole, uh, we've enjoyed uh, our time with Zach. I know I have, and uh, interesting stuff, huh? Yeah, this is great. I, I really enjoyed the episode. You're you're inspirational, and uh, I think uh, you'll you know my guess is the way you're built, you can do this as long as you wish. And uh, I, I wish you great success, and uh, you know I hopefully have the opportunity to, to chat again. Thank you for joining us on this podcast. I know you're in high demand, and I know our listeners will really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to take that as doctor's orders in terms of the, the, the doing as long as I want. <laughs> I'm good with that. I'm good. <laughs> and well, thanks Dr. So much, Cole and Zach, I'm never going to complain again about the trying to do 30 minutes of cardio. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, he says his quads are a little sore when he's running a little downhill. I was expecting something more dramatic, like, I don't, you know, something way more dramatic. I won't go into it, but oh. a little quad soreness with 100 miles. 
Gee whiz. <laughs> Great stuff. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's Sports Medicine Weekly episode with Zach Bitter. Be sure to add the Sports Medicine Weekly podcast to your playlist on Apple and Spotify. Listen in any time, any place. Subscribe to the Sports Medicine Weekly podcast. Our website is sportsmedicineweekly.com. New Sports Medicine Weekly podcasts are shared weekly on social media. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Many thanks to Zach Bitter, our ultra marathon runner and coach and uh, inspirational athletes. It's great stuff. Finally, JRF Ortho partners with orthopedic surgeons to improve the quality of life of patients by enabling them to have an active life through the generous gift of cartilage and ligament transplantation. Please go to jrfortho.org to learn more. Sign up to be a tissue donor at donatelife.net. For our producer, Alex Roca. For Dr. Brian Cole, I'm Steve Cashel. Many thanks again to our guest, Zach Bitter. We hope you enjoyed the podcast, everybody, and talk with you next time.